Hi, can I um, welcome people to the EU Exit Working Group? Is that feedback from me? I will double check it. OK, we've got a problem with... Uh, maybe it was me sh speaking a bit loudly. Um, usually we have a problem where we can't hear each other, and on this occasion <laughs> we've probably uh, done too much. So, um, so can I welcome me members and guests, uh, members of the public who might be watching on the webcast or sitting in the audience. Um, the main item of business today is London's preparedness of the EU exit uh, exit issues, as along with implications of loss of EU funding, both ESF, ERDF and higher education. Um, but before we do that, we'd like to, um, one of our, once we get into the main agenda, we've brought um, uh, one of our guests in terms is Joe uh, Owen from the Institute of Government to just give us a brief outline of where things are at with the parliamentary legislators and where do we think it's going. But let's, can we just do some formal business for our meeting first? So in opening the meeting, can I ask for apologies for absence? Are there any? No apologies have there been aren't. received. I've got no uh, real announcements other than that. Item two, declarations of interest. Can we note the declarations of interest listed on the, uh, the agenda? And do any members have any declarations to make? No, no. Okay, membership of the working group. Can we note the membership and the chairing arrangements for this year? Noted. Uh, four uh, terms of reference. Can we note the terms of reference? Noted. Uh, on item five, standing delegation safari. Can we note the standing delegations? Mm -hmm. Noted. Noted. Item six. Can we confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 28th of March 2019 as a correct record? Confirmed. Mm. Item seven. Can we note the report? Noted. And then can we go to uh, our main business in terms of um, Joe Owen, welcome Associate Director of the Institute of Government. Joe, can you just give us an update as you see things of where things have happened in Parliament since they've returned? What, what's the, where are we going on No Deal? Uh, and, you know, all those issues that arise from it. Thank you. I can definitely try, um, <laughs> with the caveat that it is changing by the minute. Um, so in terms of where things are in Parliament right now, obviously the big focus has been the passage of the EU Withdrawal Number 6 Bill, the piece of backbench legislation um, that ha passed through the Commons stage yesterday and looks set to pass the, common, uh, the Lords by the end of the week. So you can, I think it's fair to say, it is the most likely scenario by some way now that that gets royal assent on Monday. So what that legislation does uh, is essentially gives the Prime Minister until the 19th of October, which is after the October European Council, um, or the date of the October European Council, uh, in which to either approve a deal through Parliament, approve no deal through Parliament, and if neither of those things have been done, then he must seek an extension, uh, and seek an extension until the end of January next year. If the European Union, because of course it is not just up to the UK to decide the length of the extension, uh, the European Council discuss and come back with an alternative date, then Parliament has a limited amount of time in which to be able to reject that date. So Parliament still has a say um, on any extension that comes back from the European Union. So that's broadly what the legislation does. Um, the, as a consequence of this legislation passing through the Commons last night, you saw the Prime Minister call for a general election. Um, it's now, again, I think you guys will probably have a better sense than this than me, but pretty likely we're going to end up with a general election within the next couple of months. The question now is exactly when. Um, and it seems broadly you can categorise when into two buckets. There is before October 31st, and more specifically before that 19th of October deadline, uh, that seems to be the preference, uh, if you believe the news reports of the Conservative Party. The significance of that is it would allow them if returned with a majority, 
to pass that vote that I mentioned that needs to happen on the 19th of October to say we approve leaving with no deal, but also gives them time to um, negotiate a deal before the October Council. Now we can get into the relative likelihood of being able to negotiate something in just a matter of days, but um, in principle those two options are still open, deal or no deal, on the October 31st. The other option uh, for election date is after October 31st, by which point the Article 50 deadline will have been reset to what is, whatever is agreed through the extension process, assuming one is agreed. Uh, take that, for example, as the end of January, which is the UK's, at least going to be the UK's first offer if we get into... Uh, the point where the legislation, the Ben Burt legislation, is triggered on the 19th of October. So the legislation is likely to be in place. We're looking very much like a general election. The question then is when, before October 31st deadline or afterwards. Um, so that's a kind of broad, high-level state of play. If we then kind of step down underneath to look at readiness, um, it's probably worth looking at what has happened since the new government came in. Um, I think it has been fair to say that there has, uh, there has been a renewed focus on No Deal. Um, I think some of those things, there is uh, a fair challenge as to how much difference they could make by October 31st. So, uh, I think now an additional four billion has been promised for no deal preparations. It was two billion in the original additional amount, and then I believe last week or week before, uh, the Chancellor promised a further two billion. Now, given we are what now two months away, uh, less than that, your ability to spend that level of money on things like staffing when just take. If some people have a three-month notice period, you're already at the end of November, right? So your ability to spend that money in some areas is obviously severely constrained in that time, length of time, particularly when you get on to systems and processes and technology and infrastructure. There, it's not the cash that's the problem, it's the lead-in times in order to have it ready for October 31st. But if you speak to some Whitehall department, they do say that money has been very valuable not least because they were already kind of overspending in order to meet their commitments to be ready for October 31st and were worried about what would their budget would be like after October 31st because they were spending money perhaps more quickly than uh, their, um, their additional Brexit funding allocation had allowed them. Uh, so the money is, uh, is one improvement. The other thing I'd say is that actually just in terms of the internal wiring of how No Deal is being run inside government, a lot of the people who are working on it are positive about the difference that this new government has made. Positive in the sense that um, uh, whatever your political persuasion, you may not agree with the members of the current cabinet, but the members of the current cabinet agree with each other, which is kind of more than helpful which is more than necessarily was true in the previous administration so i think there were a number of cross-government no deal decisions um, one example being the communications campaign another example being additional money to backfill um, some of the holes that i'd mentioned that just couldn't get through cabinet in the run into march and just afterwards because you had one part of the cabinet saying, no deal can't happen, we're not going to sign that off. Another part of the cabinet saying, why are we so worried about this? It won't be that bad. And another, So it was really difficult to get those decisions through. That has changed now. So uh, a lot of the kind of cross-government decisions that um, departments were asking for have kind of been unblocked, as I mentioned, communications campaign and, and cash being another one. The other positive thing, uh, there's two other positive things I'd mention. One is accountability. Having this Michael Gove role clearly as on point for um, delivering Brexit no deal readiness um, means that there is a clear point of accountability and final decision maker on some of these things that wasn't quite as clear before. And also um, within the cabinet, I think it's fair to say he is perhaps one of... Uh, not sure what the best way of turning this is, 
bigger hitters <laughs> so that when he has to try and make trade-offs around the cabinet table and say your, your department's falling behind here we need you to up your game over here then he's got the credibility with his cabinet colleagues to try and drive that again I think that's seen as a kind of a positive development um, and the other positive development I'd say is um, a kind of uh, loosening of the quite um, well, really counterproductive secrecy that was going on inside Whitehall, um, particularly in the run into March, which I think I spoke to you about last time I came, which was um, the fact, just basic things, that key documents ahead of key meetings could only be circulated on special computers that only a very small number of people in the department had access to, and if you're getting them at very short time frames your ability as a department to coordinate a response and provide the best information and input to that cabinet committee meeting was really limited. And that has loosened um, under the new, um, the new government. My understanding is that meetings for the, the Michael Gove daily um, XO meeting uh, on no deal readiness is now circulated by email rather than these on specific ROSA terminals, which might sound like a really trivial thing, but actually within departments they feel has made a real difference. Um, so those would be some of the positive things that I would point to uh, in terms of progress in some areas on no deal preparation. Um, but there are some um, kind of um, Negatives, I think that it's fair to say you could point to. Um, the first thing I would say is that you saw the um, Yellowhammer assumptions published in Sunday Times. Now, those are assumptions that government, my understanding, they've been around or being worked on since the end of last year. They're there to kind of provide a common picture across Whitehall as to what actually no deal would look like. So all of the different departments know what to plan for and they're kind of singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, they were extremely difficult to agree um, and a very torturous process trying to get those nailed down. But once they got them nailed down, it did give the rest of Whitehall an ability to coordinate around. Since they have been leaked, there has been lots of talks about revisiting them and I think there's a real question as to what the value of spending time revisiting assumptions are at this stage in the game, because if you're saying you are going to revisit them to make them look, uh, to make it look less disruptive, then you know, you've already planned for a scenario that is more disruptive, so you should take comfort in the fact that you've got a bit of leeway in terms of what you've prepared for versus what actually may play out and I think it's quite hard to see the value in spending time revising assumptions when you are just weeks out. You're kind of at the point where it's no longer a policy conversation you're having. This is a delivery conversation and you just got to kind of head down and focus. The other area which is similar to that is some of the policy decisions seem to have been reopened, particularly the no deal policy decisions. So um, we know, I think it's fair to say that the government will be looking at the tariff policies, the no deal tariffs, which um, are so sensitive to businesses. They kind of had plenty of objections with the ones that came out in March, but kind of behind closed doors, walking up new tariffs and then dumping them down within weeks of a new deadline is also not particularly helpful um, because some kind of actually quite helpful to have a planning horizon and you have some certainty about what kind of tariffs you're going to be dealing with. The other area where I think the effect of reopening policy decisions has been uh, probably more significant is around immigration uh, and the um, kind of announcement, if you can call it that, a couple of weeks ago that the current or the, the, the previous government's no deal immigration plan was being re-looked at because it wasn't uh, a big enough kind of break from free movement. It didn't provide an enforceable end to free movement on the 31st of October, and they were going to look again at something else. Now, um, that, I think, had a number of problems. I mean, first, there was no legislative route for delivering that, um, other than passing an immigration bill where, as we've seen from the last two days, Parliament is not necessarily... Um, uh, it's not the easiest place to rush through legislation at the moment if you're the government. Um, 
Um, so there's a legislative problem. Um, from uh, a kind of delivery perspective, this is kind of telling the Home Office that a key part of their plan that they thought had been agreed, signed off, and was not a problem for them. Um, and when you think about all of the other things the Home Office are dealing with around no deal, actually having one bit tied away was quite helpful. Having that reopened at the last minute um, caused, uh, I can imagine, a bit of a tiz. Um, and then um, the final thing, which is perhaps most significant, is the uncertainty for EU citizens, where previously they had been given guarantees that they would have until at the end of 2020 to apply for the settlement scheme. The government still continued to make that statement, but by also saying that free movement would enforceably end on the 31st of October, I mean, you can only have one of those two things. Um, you cannot have both of those things. And so I think a lot of the kind of goodwill that the Home Office had worked quite hard to try and the government had worked quite hard to build up with EU citizens even you know, considering that it was a really uncertain time at best and that level of goodwill probably wasn't enormous, but that had a major effect on just kind of the levels of confidence and certainty for the three and a half million um, EU citizens. So that's another area where I think, um, uh, I think there has been a kind of step back, like reopening these policy decisions. Again, as I say, we're in delivery mode now. You don't really have the luxury of time to to revisit policy questions. Um, there's still a massive outstanding gap on the government's policy for the Irish border under no deal. Um, they've kind of said what it is, but I don't, I certainly haven't met anyone uh, inside government outside in Northern Ireland that thinks it's a credible plan really, um, in part because of just the nature of the problem. Um, and then the final thing I'd say before I stop talking is the election. And to come back to the first point I made, for no deal preparations, there is a massive difference between an election before October 31st, in which October 31st is suddenly back in play as a day where we leave without a deal, and January, the end of January. Now, obviously, because time, and time is very helpful in these situations, but particularly um, if you look at the early election around, say, the 15th of October is the date that's been floated, for the government, for civil service, there are rules around PERDA and what can and cannot happen in a general election campaign. And I think the government itself says that its biggest risk for no deal is third party readiness. And the PERDA rules essentially limit the way government can communicate with third parties during an election campaign. So the new communications campaign that's been launched would presumably have to stop any policy announcements around no deal would not be able to take place. So the government's either in this position where it pressures the civil service to kind of um, move around the PERDA convention, which is a really difficult position for the civil service to be in and politicizes them and for a whole host of reasons um, as a kind of key convention is something that under no circumstances you want to do or you're asking the civil service to sit on their hands, basically, for the critical three or four weeks in the run into this huge change where they can't really properly communicate with all of the people that need to change, that would need to also adapt uh, under no deal. So that particular scenario and the introduction of PERDA in that time frame poses, I think, a really, really big problem um, for how just the day-to-day -day of no-deal planning and communication can operate inside the civil service while an election campaign is going on. Okay, well, thank you um, for that. Um, just one bit. On the, um, on the current bill that's making its progress through the House of Lords, uh, only in this country it could happen. The Stephen Kinnock Amendment, which is the old Theresa May a motion that wasn't taken, which was withdrawn by her government then. Is that is that correct? Is that somewhere in that bill? Yeah, be, so, that, so that can be debated at some stage if, if so Parliament not, wants to. I would need to double check the wording of the amendment, which I may, rather than flicking through. I mean, my understanding is that it isn't really, there's no material change that comes from it. It um, means that 
um, the government is looking for an extension with the ambition of trying to pass a deal but doesn't require them to bring back the bill, the withdrawal yep. agreement. Theresa May's withdrawal agreement for a vote. Um, and so my understanding uh, last night was that it didn't really change anything. But you're right, it is quite peculiar that it somehow managed to, to get through, um, yeah. Okay, uh, quick questions, uh, starting with um, Assembly Member Boff. Um, the government's made declarations about things like agricultural funding after, after a no-deal Brexit. Has any made any declarations about uh, structural funding uh, replacing EU structural funding after a no deal Brexit? So, my understanding is that uh, you need to check to your wife and write to you about this that there is also similar guarantees around structural funding in the short term, which has been the kind of government's approach across the piece to EU funding, yeah. was to say in the kind of immediate term, people won't be out of pocket but there is still I think some uncertainty well, I, would need I think to the agricultural one is 2022 until 2022 so I think agriculture got one of the longest timelines in terms of um, in terms of uh, certainty I mean the other thing around funding that I didn't mention when I talked about the additional money was the um, the kind of uh, for want of a better phrase bailout fund that the government has committed to for businesses hardest hit under no deal, um, which is something that I don't think, I certainly haven't seen any further information on exactly how they were planning to do it, but they had already talked about additional funding beyond agriculture, the kind of the continuation of the, uh, the CAP funding, the Common Agricultural Policy funding, uh, that there would also be money available for those um, farmers and producers who were hardest hit under a no deal. Um, particularly the kind of obvious example is the sheep farmers in Wales who suddenly face huge tariffs and can no longer afford to sell uh, into the European Union um, and that they were thinking about that the bailout fund would be much broader than just agriculture um, given that businesses across the country uh, would be hit potentially for a number of ways whether it is um, tariffs um, into the EU mean that it is no longer kind of viable for them to trade or um, in the kind of case of the, the sheep farmers. The other one is just supply chain disruptions. So the process of getting certificates, the potential disruption in Dover and Calais means that smaller businesses may face cash flow issues if their ability to trade in the short term is restricted. Um, so that's one of the other reasons. And then the other reason would be competition from um, uh, other countries as a result of the government's no-deal tariff policies. So those are some of the things in the mix for this new, um, this new fund for supporting businesses that the government has announced, but we are yet, I think, uh, the latest, when I checked earlier this week, I hadn't found any further information on it. Thank you. Assembly Member Russell. Um, yes, I just wanted to pick up on some of the um, freedom of movement and immigration um, stuff. I and mean, first of all, uh, you were saying that um, the the, uh, the current immigration plan, or the one from the previous, the Theresa May government, um, didn't provide an end to freedom of movement at the end of at, at the 31st of October. Whereas, as I understand it, in August, the current government did put an end to the freedom of movement. S yes. Uh, or suggested. Suggested they would want to, yes. Um, so, uh, and I think you described it as a, uh, as a massive tiz, or maybe it was my massive and your word yeah. tiz. Yeah. Um, uh, so... Are you saying that civil servants have been asked to work out how to end freedom of movement on the 31st of October? Or so they were, the, the, the government's no deal immigration plan, which was the EU temporary leave to remain, um, was taken to uh, the cabinet committee, the Michael Gove XO cabinet committee, 
and the decision came out that we needed something um, more enfor kind of more enforceable end to free movement, and I'll kind of explain what I mean by that in a moment. Uh, on October 31st, and then the Home Office was told to kind of go away and come up with a set of options, basically. Now, actually, at the end of yesterday, the government, I think, announced that actually they were reverting back to the original plan and formally put out more no-deal guidance, which looked, uh, at least from my glance through it late last night, pretty much the same as the Theresa May plan. So I think it's fair to say they've given up on the plans of trying to do a bigger change mm -hmm. at the end of October. When I kind of make the difference between kind of meaningfully or enforceably ending free movement and actually ending is that as free movement is a kind of concept in EU law that goes both ways, that will, by matter of a fact, end on the 31st of October in that British citizens will no longer be able to just freely move to the EU um, under free movement rules. But the the point I would kind of around enforceably ending free movement is that under the government's no deal plans, under the previous government and now as of yesterday under this government, um, the same, the EU citizens can move here. Um, they have a period of three months to look for a job, which is the same under free movement. If they do that, they just need to register with the Home Office to say that they are looking to stay here. There will be some criminality checks, but there will be no way of actually enforcing that. So EU citizens will be able to move here, take if we leave on the 31st of October in November and December, and they will be able to access jobs, um, housing, in exactly the same way as they would have under free movement. There will be no real kind of tangible difference. Um, the difference will only come once a new immigration system uh, as per the government's white paper, the previous government's white paper, unless that changes significantly, um, comes into place, which is, I think, at the soonest, the beginning of 2021. So there will be this continued, where in practice, free movement essentially continues for EU but, citizens but coming to the UK. But during that period, British citizens living abroad and EU citizens currently living here will need to get themselves organised to be ready for whatever the regime is. And at the moment, it's not certain, are you saying, what, it is, what, what the setup is going to be? Or are we working on the basis of what had been set up by Theresa May's government? So in terms of the, the future immigration system, so the kind of January 2021 scenario, um, the, I think it is fair to say there is some uncertainty as to whether the white paper as it was when it was published in December last year is still this government's policy um, because there has been lots of statements around an Australian-style point system um, I think that uh, they have asked that what they have asked the Migration Advisory Committee to have a look at the Australian style point system, which could mean that the policy as was set out by the previous government gets changed in light of those recommendations or it doesn't at the moment it's very hard to tell if or how uh, the white paper that was published at the end of last year by the previous government will change or not under this government. And is there time between now and January 2021, it's just over a year, to get a new immigration system set up and tell people about it so they can comply with it? Yeah, so, I mean, to, is there time? To put it in perspective, the way um, I was told is that um, the government would need to publish the immigration rules, the detailed immigration rules that will form the basis of that system at the very beginning of next year to give businesses a year to adapt. They would also um, then need to start kind of putting people on the system, businesses on the system, because we have a sponsorship system, which means sponsors need to be registered with the Home Office. And so that new system, if you like, has to be up and running well before the date in which businesses need to use it because those businesses need to be on the system, know how to use it, registered with the Home Office, 
and have gone through that process. So therefore, you're looking at basically needing a system up and running by this time next year, more or less. Now, how deliverable is that? Um, obviously, the, uh, the Home Office have been working on this for some time. It took until it took them about 18 months of delay to get the white paper out, but I think during that time they were doing quite a lot of detailed work on it, and it's fair to say it was a detailed white paper. Um, I think it still um, it still must be quite likely that the date shifts beyond January 2021, um, not least if this government is looking to reopen conversations about policy. Um, the Migration Advisory Committee uh, were asked to look at points-based system. I haven't actually seen the terms of reference, but you know, assume that takes three months from the point at which the government issued it, which was end of July, then you're not really getting any decisions until the back end of this year out of the Migration Advisory Committee. How do you then turn that into immigration rules for the timeline that I mentioned really early next year so i think the more the government changes its view on the immigration system as was designed by um the previous government the more and more unrealistic the january date looks but i think it's fair, you know this is a huge job if you look at how long it took government to roll out the last big change to the immigration system which was i think around 2008 and 9 um possibly slightly earlier than that. Um, our view is that it, when we spoke to people was that they thought it was four years from the point at which it was designed to the point at which it was fully rolled out. Um, and they thought this was a bigger change. Now, does a new technological approach inside the Home Office and new ways of working and a very kind of hard uh, stop mean that you could do it quicker than that? Probably. Does it mean you can kind of effectively cut that in half? Yeah. I, mean, I think there's something we're going to be coming back to, isn't Come it, in a future meeting? That. But yeah. thank you, that's really helpful. Okay, uh, somebody member Pigeon? I just wanted to go back and ask rather a simple question in some ways. But when you're talking about the legislation that's going through, rushing through um, Parliament as we speak, you were still talking then about the summit in October and no deal, but this legislation rules out no deal being an option at all or have I misunderstood it or so it rule it doesn't rule out no deal as an option at all because there is a provision in there that says we could still leave with no deal on the 31st of October if a majority of MPs vote in favor of no deal um, which of course if you have an election and it returns a different parliamentary arithmetic then it is possible that if there were an early election, say on the 15th of October, mm -hmm. that before the point of the 19th of October, when this legislation kind of triggers the reaction to go to the council, you could, it's well, possible so to then have a vote. Yeah. That's you only if the parliament numbers change. Exactly, yeah. Okay, okay, I've got that now, thank you. Um, I think the stuff on immigration is, is very, we're gonna come back to that, and maybe we might want Joe at that panel as well, but I think, Home Office and technology, um, that fills me with horror, really, and uh, I can't see it being delivered quickly, but I'll leave it there. I'm going to return to the subject, look at it both from a um, business sector point of view. Recently, NHS have made some announcements, but also from uh, a, a, the ordinary person's point yes. of view, have been through the system, those who've got through it and those who haven't. So we might well come back mm. to you and explore further with you some of those issues that you've said, if we can in the future. Yeah. I think it's, there's a really interesting set of issues that the Home Office face around uh, the EU settlement scheme and the fact that even if they play an absolute blinder and get 90% of eligible citizens, EU citizens, through the system, which if you look at international comparators would be an extremely good job, 10% of 3.5 million is still a lot of people who don't have status. And when... Um, our system is geared in the way it is around proof of documentation around status, then it creates a kind of a really big challenge, I think, for the Home Office and, and how they enforce. But yeah, very happy to come back at another time. 
Are our members content so we move on? Thanks very much, Joe. Um, as always, very insightful. Thank you very much. Um, if we could welcome our next uh, guest to come down. Now, if we can, um, it's Dr. Fiona Twycross, Assembly Member, but also uh, Deputy Mayor for Fire Resilience and responsible for overseeing uh, our resilience ar arrangements around no deal preparation and any other issues that may arise from Brexit, as well as John Everington, Deputy Head of Emergency Planning and London Fire Brigade. So, thank you very much. You've obviously been very busy. You've been before us uh, before, but just, uh, I suppose, my first question. Have we managed to, um, in terms of the, the only growl of resilience planning, worked out the, um, can you share the assumptions that uh, government have given you to work on uh, across your different sector groups that are working on behalf of Londoners? Has that been resolved yet? I mean, we had the absurdity of confidentiality agreements, people you couldn't talk to, you couldn't share information to enable effective planning for no deal or, or any other issues that may arise. Where are we on that? Um, we've still got a situation in which the London Resilience Forum has access to three named individuals to the uh, national planning assumptions with very clear prohibition against those being shared more widely. Um, as I think I mentioned in a previous meeting, um, I had to take legal advice in order to um, be able to share those with the Mayor, who is formerly the uh, Chair of the London Resilience Forum. Uh, we were quite interested to hear that there was apparently a greater sharing between government departments, which is welcome, but what we haven't seen is um, that increased trust with uh, local resilience forums. And as we've got a statutory duty to warn and inform actually both the public, but um, definitely uh, members of the partnership. And as you know, the London Resilience Partnership is made up of 200 organisations who've got a responsibility or role in uh, responding to uh, civil contingencies. We think that one of the most welcome improvements we could see would be a loosening up of, of being allowed to at least, at the very least, share those planning assumptions in written form um, with our trusted partners. I suppose we should be uh, thankful for the Sunday Times leak then of Yellowhammer well, that at least showed some aspects of government preparations or well, what their assumptions were. Well, to be, to, be, to be frank, I've been in a slightly ludicrous position as chair of the London Resilience Forum of having to refer people to some of the media stories. Um, which um, are generally of much earlier versions of documents that we've then been sent ourselves in a um, more refined version. But the best way for us to give accurate information to partners and in order for us to then sort of give appropriate information to the public would be if, uh, if we were able to share documents with people direct. And I think that... Um, if, if there's one thing I'd like to see in the um, immediate future is people actually recognising that local resilience forums aren't the source of leaks um, and should be trusted more to use, the, um, to use what is obviously quite sensitive information, but to use it appropriately in order to facilitate <coughs> proper planning for um, what could very well still be a no-deal Brexit. Yesterday at the Police and Crime Committee, we heard from uh, the Metropolitan Police Service in terms of their preparations were uh, primarily around public disorder mm -hmm. and protection issues that may re result, but also about the deployment overseas, if asked, if asked to Northern Ireland of mm -hmm. a certain number of our officers, some of those that would be specialists. Um, just remind us again of the focus of some of your work of what we think were the key issues around, uh, particularly around no deal. So we, uh, one of our earlier sessions, I think you were <laughs> present 
We heard from our ELF colleagues about some of the problems they were facing. What, what, just paint the picture of what the key issues you've been working on since you last reported to us. Are they still the same or are there new ones develop, uh, come on? They're, they're quite similar, but oh. obviously the timing, uh, the, the October or later yes. date sort of changes yeah. things. I'll hand over to John maybe to... The issues are largely the same. We still we still face the, the same problems: supply chain, workforce, uh, and then systems changes. We, we are changing whole scale, systematic changes overnight. Uh, so it is extremely difficult to actually predict what is coming up or, or going to happen. The, the planning assumptions are our our best estimate. They are just that. Um, there, there isn't a great deal of change. We still see the, the supply chain, the food, the fuel, the medicines issue, the workforce issue, uh, uh, and yeah, EU nationals um, coming through, uh, and then the wider systems failures, uh, sorry, not failures, but, but potential issues um, around our ports, uh, the, the short straits, uh, a disruption to travel, um, and then the knock-on effects. I think, I think the, the greatest difficulty is the, the cocktail and domino effect uh, that these impacts will have that we just cannot foresee. So in the run-up to March, um, we came up against an issue where wooden pallet crates used in haulage needed to be treated to go over to the EU once we became a third member state. Uh, that would be a huge logistical issue just in its own right um, and came out of nowhere. So, so there are a whole host of unforeseen mm. small issues that will, will cause problems going forward. One of the issues, just following stuff in the press and it was in, in public, was I thought that the real lack of any issue about uh, human behaviour. We touched on it yesterday. So if the, the man or woman from the ministry tells me my fuel is all right yeah. <laughs> uh, and I don't need to worry, what should I do? I mean, my first inclination, if, even if that was even raised don't in a discussion, up. is to go and fill up. Is that the same, uh, you know, uh, have you done any thinking around or have you had in conversation with your various partners in the various subgroups about or human behaviour, whether it's yeah. uh, what, what, what flows, even if it's totally you know is not the outcome of where we are i think one of the biggest risks is um uh around perceptions so i think that um at any time of year or any time of the week or any time of the day you could have shelves empty on a supermarket if you overlay that with the context of brexit and a no deal brexit potentially with sort of um, concerns about political instability, um, generally uh, elections that are sort of hard fought on um, issues around Brexit, um, a, a normal um, empty shelf could be perceived by anybody to be a shelf because other, either, either there are shortages or they feel that other people are stocking up on goods and that could lead um, not just to stockpiling, but to panic buying, which is um, another, another issue in itself. So when we've gone through and discussed issues in the partnership, we have talked about um, human behaviour. It, it may well be true that there would be enough food nutritionally to go around, but as we've seen from reports this week, that isn't the same as... Um, there being everything people are used to seeing in, in the supermarkets or their local shop or a market. And the time of year means that there would be um, less fresh produce grown in this country anyway. So, But all these things combined with human psychology, uh, potentially the run-up to Christmas and other religious festivals, you've got people sort of concerned about, um, I mean, a very sort of flippant level, are they going to get their Brussels sprouts, So, um, which would be a big concern in my family. <laughs> then you've got the potential for people to actually um, start panicking. Um, we didn't see that in the spring, um, and um, part of that might have been that actually, despite the fact that no deal um, was on the table, that actually people didn't feel that it was really going to happen. And I think this time with the political rhetoric, um, people are probably more likely to believe in no deal as an absolute sort of possibility. So I think we don't know quite what will happen, what people... But I think we know that when there's shortages in shops, people panic and start buying anyway. So we know that happens in, in winter, for example, when there's bread shortages. Um, we had, uh, when we had the beast from the East, we had fights in supermarkets over bread. 
um, and that was just sort of one or two days delay because of snow. So I think that we have to overlay what could happen with human psychology. We have to find mechanisms and routes to give people those reassurances um, that there isn't a shortage if there isn't, and that's one of the things that we've been discussing about strengthening is how we strengthen that comms. So, for example, on fuel, um, if, if the biggest risk to fuel is people panic <coughs> buying, then we need to make sure we've got mechanisms in place to make sure that if it is just a, a local um, petrol station with its normal sort of low petrol the day before delivery, that actually we can get that message out quickly, that we've got the contacts, that we've got the context. But because it's in the context of a marketplace, that's actually a bit more, more complex. And social media could, could fuel um, local concerns because it's not just you driving past a queue outside a petrol station. It's potentially you seeing something about a petrol station that could be 200 miles away from you and reacting as a result. So I think um, uh, it is about making sure that we... Um, think about all eventualities and we overlay that with human psychology just to think about what could go wrong that doesn't mean there's an easy solution to some of these issues but at least thinking about them in advance has meant that um, partners have had an opportunity to discuss where the greatest risks are so in, in, a, in essence you you're moving on taking practical uh, actions in terms of minim, in minimizing the potential disruption across across the piece so are you then moving towards this communication plan for an instant response of telling people or a longer term one? We heard earlier about the government's one of getting ready. It's, it's going to be a really difficult issue, isn't it, with, with people in, with very determined views, both mm -hmm. leavers and remainers, to say, yeah, that's not true, or no, you're selling us that. So is there an information campaign that specifically that will happen in London, either through your networks of where information can go out before myths occur about what's really happening or not. I it's mean, difficult to do it before myths occur, but yeah. John, can you talk through the mechanics of it? Yeah, that's the real nub of the problem that we have of yeah. what, what is the role of the, the London Resilience Forum? It is to work with the agencies and partners in response to an incident. That's where we've always been before, yeah. predominantly led by emergency services and other public sector bodies in this instance there are major other drivers there's uk national policy there's yep. eu policy there's individual organizations both public sector and private sector and then the public behavior on there so so the the sphere of influence for the lrf as it were is very limited to those organizations and there is no additional magic resource that is warehouses full of stocks that we can promote or, or go forward um, it was interesting that Joe said there's a, a loosening up of information being shared uh, mm -hmm. across government that we haven't seen, but the real piece that we need in terms of reassurance are what are the government plans, yeah. because so many of these consequences rely mm -hmm. on major policy changes. Uh, and as we, we, we heard just before with the previous guest, it, it, we haven't seen the immigration policy, which is one of the fundamental issues to people in, in terms of whether or not they're entitled to stay in, in the country and their, their futures. Mm -hmm. so, so what about the fuel and the certainty? What about the, f the food and the changes? Uh, there's very little we can do if we don't have the food to give people. We can't magic things up. There has to be a change in, in the way that it's distributed or a change in the way that people can access the food in terms of the money they have available to spend on it. So what are the policy changes that we would uh, put in place to support that? That can't come from us. That has to come from government in this stage to prepare people. At the moment, the campaigns are all how people can ready themselves. What they really need access to is what is what else is being done to enable them not to have to ready themselves, but to, to carry on going about their day-to-day -day work. And, and just one more specific, about the data issue. We touched on it with the NHS colleagues, but it must be wider. Those with servers based abroad, what happens on any key dates if we reach if no deal occurred, which could still happen, or those issues, does government give any advice about the implications of that uh, with as we leave the EU? Is that not being da data service would be the responsibility of individual organisations within the partnership? Um, we haven't been sent anything particularly about um, data and data issues. 
but we, we can we can ask about it and feedback. It'd be interesting to see who's got it. problems or who believes they've got problems and what yeah. actions they've taken to ameliorate those problems. I'm quite interested in that because I suspect from our NHS colleagues when we first asked the question there were clearly some trusts that may have problems mm. or yeah. not. It depends. It, it depends if uh, a common sense approach of partnering, but but clearly about the rules, isn't it? Yeah. And what happens from day one. Okay. Um, Thank you. Assemblymember Russell. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to pick up on something that, John, you were just saying. Um, when you were talking about um, uh, fuel and food um, availability and whether there are going to need to be some policy changes around distribution and access to them, is that what I understood? Um, and, uh, and that you needed to understand more about what the government's thinking was mm. before you can do any planning. But were you referring to a potential for some kind of rationing or mm. sharing out? Um, rationing is quite a... a, a uh, sorry, a, that's probably a, a yeah, too no, I, 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 blunt a word. I, I, I but understand where you're coming from. So, so if I take them both uh, individually, uh, fuel is, is probably easier. So we, there is no indication that there will be a shortage of fuel per se. Um, but we have a number of effects that could have a cumulative effect to cause disruption to the supply chain, um, whether it be traffic disruption um, or just increased traffic around uh, fuel distribution sites um, or just the public behaviour of spotting images uh, and then running um, forecourts down um, when actually there isn't a problem at all. And we've seen other cases recently uh, Extension Rebellion where they put out images uh, and tried to attribute them to London in terms of a, a boat crossing the, the motorway where actually it was in Scotland. Uh, there's been other instances where we've seen social media images used that were years old. So there are already social media images out there that could be used to exacerbate a problem. So that's where the fuel issue arises from. The, the, there is no indication that we have seen that would suggest that we'd have a shortage of fuel uh, yeah. unless there is a problem to the disruption. In terms of food, uh, again, the planning assumption is that there would be uh, not a, a lack of food, but a restriction in choice, uh, particularly in fresh produce, um, but that we will expect food price rises. So we know that that will affect those that are most vulnerable to um, food prices at the moment. Um, and therefore creates greater social inequality and problems in terms of access uh, of vulnerable communities. So that's where the difficulties yep. in food will arise. Thank you. That, that's, that's really clear. Um, so mo moving on, um, the Theresa May government um, ordered government departments to wind down emergency preparations after the 12th of April 2019, which was the last date when the UK was um, expected to leave the EU. Has this affected London's readiness in any way? If I can say that we continued our work at the, at the same tempo, so we did notice that central government effectively uh, appeared to... Um, uh, stop more proactive preparation for no deal um, we did have a review of what had of, of what activity had taken place which has been fed into the 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 new work but it, it did appear to us that actually um, there wasn't an awful lot that we were being asked to do so what we did was to continue to have the regular meetings to start um, we did our own review of how we felt um, the partnership had approached the run-up to the first two Brexit dates, if I could call them that, um, and so we could review it for um, this autumn. So we have changed um, uh, relatively slightly, but we have changed how we are planning to um, to operate the strategic coordinating groups and what kind of additional resources we might bring in with the additional money we've got from central government. Um, so we still had the regular monthly meeting that I chair. Um, John and his team still worked with uh, partners around what concerns they had. Um, over the um, last few months, we've developed a number of playbooks, so we've gone much more thematic. So rather than looking at sort of individual agencies, we've, we've sort of started looking at themes, so around the food and fuel and things like social care. 
so that rather than um, saying to individual agencies what are the issues they're facing, we're looking at the themes that um, people might be concerned about and how we can best sort of um, uh, have coordination about those. Although, um, as, um, as, as, um, as, as John, uh, well, it's been said before, we, um, we haven't always had as much um, information to, to support the, the planning process, and that, that's, that's clearly an issue. So we give, we give information in, we very rarely get sort of a comprehensive sort of overview back. And one of the things I think would be most helpful would be for us to get an understanding of what um, what assumptions are planning assumptions other LRFs are working to and how those differ to ours so we can test ours against other people's um, assumptions and get a bit of a, a nuance so that we can actually test our assumptions to make sure we're not missing things or that we haven't made assumptions that other people are sort of going, well, that's wrong because. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to refine it, um, but we do need more more information um, to um, enable us to do that. That's information from central government. Can, can these different LRFs just get together? We do, to be honest. Uh, yeah, and we're doing that on Monday with uh, London South East LRFs. It, it's a matter of having, I think, 56 days to go from today to the 31st of October, which is the date that we are still working to until we're told otherwise. Is it easier for us to all go out and, and kind of go through that information ourselves mm -hmm. or to be presented a, a kind of comprehensive report that of all the information that we've already provided to central government? It, it's economies of scale mm -hmm. here and, and kind of... I mean, efficiency yeah. of effort. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We can do workarounds, but to be honest, the it's time's got. It's, it's there's too limit. There's too limit little time mm. for us to continue to have to do workarounds, and that that applies equally to sharing information from other LRFs, from government departments, and to be able to share the planning assumptions that government has given myself, John Hetherington, and John Baradell. Yep. Um, moving on slightly, um, to think about how Londoners are being informed about EU exit preparations. What are you doing around that, or what is being done about that by you or by others? Um, I think, again, that would come to responsibility for individual agencies. The, um, the LRF's responsibility, is, as John's pointed out, the, the general function of the LRF is to respond to incidents. Here we've been asked to coordinate Brexit contingency planning, um, that uh, potentially will increase um, sort of in terms of communications, but the, the way that the LRF functions, that would be in relation to a specific incident. So information that's been provided to Londoners would have um, predominantly, I think, come from um, uh, some of the work that the mayor has been doing so you've got the information hub, you've got the work that's been done. There was a bus in, in March. Yep. There's been events here. There's another event here on the 21st of September for EU Londoners. Um, but also there's work that um, uh, Rajesh um, Agarwal has done in terms of uh, business preparedness. And I think you'll probably hear more about that from um, speakers later on this afternoon. Yep. Um, I mean, just some of the information that sort of the preparations for London businesses um, that I think has come through the growth hub, um, businesses are being asked, have you taken appropriate steps to support your EU staff to gain residency status, but, um, but we don't even, uh, we've just heard from Joe that nobody yet knows what the residency things are that have got to be complied with so um do you are, are, are you seeing the immigration situation um and the uncertainty as part of the brief in terms of brexit disruption that you are looking at from the perspective of the LRF, as opposed to teams at the GLA that would sort of look at the um, growth hub and issues like that, and you are talking to Alex Conway in the next session, um, we've looked at immigration and issues around immigration and um, 
outward migration in terms of risks, so in terms of broader risks to um, uh, uh, staffing of social care, of hospitals. Um, I think the, um, the King's Fund um, research or letter that came late earlier in the week referred to research that showed that a large portion of EU doctors were considering um, re leaving, leaving the UK. So we would be concerned about it from the point of view of um, could London continue to, um, to function and would there be a resilience aspect in terms of the functionality of London. That's not to say that we wouldn't be interested, um, some of us from a personal context, about sort of migration and migration rules. Mm. However, um, the key function of the discussions we've had at the LRF has been around risks to... Um, risks to workforce generally, mm -hmm. as opposed to the, the rights of um, EU citizens that's been dealt with by um, other parts of the GLA family. Mm -hmm. And as uh, John just said, we've got 56 days left um, until the 31st mm -hmm. of October. Um, do you have plans to make sure that as those 56 days go down, that Londoners get the information they need to avoid some, you know, the kind of any risks that might come about from Londoners not having the information they need. Well, I think there's a responsibility of government to make sure that the information is there because, mm -hmm. um, and this this is where clarity over what the responsibility of the partnership sort of really matters. We we can only, I mean. If we're going to put out information, we need to be confident that's really accurate. If we don't think we're getting all the information government has, A, if government feels this is information the public should have, they should give it out directly and be much more transparent about what they know the risks and potential issues to be. But equally, um, we shouldn't just be sticking a finger in the, the air and saying um, and sort of putting formal stuff out because it's about assurance of the partnership capabilities to respond to sort of the implications of a no-deal Brexit. That, that's the role of the London Resilience Forum. The information aspect would definitely come elsewhere. That's not to say that we don't have an information responsibility if something happens. For example, if there's panic around fuel, we would want to make sure that that was addressed and rebuffed if appropriate or people acknowledge there's a problem if there is a problem, mm. but that's where the information responsibility of the LRF would come. Um, other, other, other parts of the organisation would have a, a, another responsibility, for example, about citizens' rights. That's not the function of the LRF or the responsibility yep. of the LRF, but I think that more clarity and more openness on government where they do have information, and I think there probably is a lack of information. I think sometimes we can see that there's not information coming out and assume that there's stuff that other people have got that we think should be there. So I think, but where they have got information, then we would um, be keen for that to be um, circulated as widely as possible and to the public where appropriate. Thank you. Assembly Member Pidgey. Yeah, we've talked a lot about food and fuel today in terms of your contingency planning, but what work is the forum doing around medicines and particularly there are some uh, cancer treatments that are very time limited that I know are imported um, from other parts of the European Union. What work are you doing with the NHS in that area because that literally is about saving people's mm -hmm. lives? Um, so, so at the last meeting I think in, in February you had uh, two members from NHS England uh, so, so they are looking at that issue in particular so so again I, I go back to to what the LRF does we do the multi-agency aspect so medicines and medical supplies sit firmly within um, NHS England uh, and Department of Health and Social Care it is their remit it is their statutory responsibility to do that so so all of that planning is being led by um, DHSC uh, where there is a need for multi-agency action that's where the LRF will come into it. So we, we hold the Brexit Contingency Planning Group on a monthly basis. NHS are always there and represented mm -hmm. at a, 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 a good level, a strategic level, uh, and they will flag the issues. But at the moment, they're working through that in terms of 
the, the national planning in terms of stockpiling and uh, making sure the availability of medicines. So have they flagged any particular issues for London? Obviously, they're, I don't think they like to use the word stockpiling, but no. clearly they are what stockpiling drugs. Buffer. They can, but they're a time limited, some of these. I don't know, I'm not medically trained, sort of, I wouldn't say radioactive, that's not the right word, but, you know, sort of mm. some of these yeah, very see. specific um, cancer treatments and the like, they, they've got to be used very, very quickly. I mean, are there going to be issues around those supplies? And has that been flagged with you? The isotopes. Not directly as, a, as an issue where we can support as an LRF. That's not to say that it's not an issue, uh, but it's being dealt with in another arena by the Department of Health. But as we, we saw this week, the King's Fund made a, quite a stark warning around the shortages and the price rises for medical medicines and medical devices. So it, it, I'm not saying that it's not an issue. It is not an issue in our arena where we would have a leverage to be able to, to kind of influence our, our, that going forwards. Yeah. And, and, and this is the real dichotomy that we have in terms of having an overarching view over everything, but actually very little power or leverage to influence that um, uh, going forward. So, so every organisation needs to support itself. And um, to be frank, the only mitigation um, that would really work against the consequences of a no-deal Brexit would be to not have a no-deal Brexit. Um, so, and um, that might sound a bit flippant, but if we're worried about um, life-saving drugs um, and the potential for them to not be able to get into the UK, then the best way to avoid that happening is to make sure um, that um, we don't leave the EU with a, with a no deal. So irrespective of whether we leave the EU or not, um, leaving with a, without a deal um, contains risks that can only be properly avoided by avoiding a no deal. Thank you. Okay. So, so that, that just give you a scenario, and it's not your responsibility, but it is part of your yeah. subgroup. So I may, um, uh, I've got some specialised drugs. I might well be living at home. I've no family, and I've got a care agency visiting me, whatever the care offer is. And if I get into difficulty, is there, are you aware, because you might not be aware, but hopefully Mr Baradell could be able to tell us, mm -hmm. That, that there is knowledge of that care agency of where to go to in their local area to say this is an emergency situation, something has gone terribly wrong and this person needs sorting out. Because I think it gets down to as, about, as, as, as detailed as that at that level, albeit I recognise that uh, a teaching hospital or a strategic hospital in London that serves a national population, not just a London population, of specialised care will be able to work out that and plan that. It's the little, the little ones that are caught between. Do we know if that sort of detailed level of planning, or well, one, it may not well be required, and someone says, no, don't worry yeah. about that, Len Duval, you don't need to worry about that. But if it is required, is it dealt with by our local government colleagues and they can, and they're thinking that through? So, so I think our, our premise in, in any uh, incident uh, that, that we deal with is, is to try and deliver normal services in, yep. in abnormal circumstances. Uh, and that should not differ uh, in, in this. So, so speaking to um, a colleague this morning who, who has had previous um, experience working within Department of Health and Social uh, Services, so, or Social Care, sorry, what they were looking at is that GPs and the drug provision should be mm -hmm. exactly the same as normal, but the point at which it enters the company or working with suppliers is where the government uh, mitigation plans yeah. are acting so that normal services are provided as far as possible. Yeah. So it is, it's that okay. upstream yeah. drug provision that is done on a much uh, larger scale and kind of tracked back through the system looking at the, the kind of initial entry points into the UK which is where we, we start to hear about the kind of um, air freighting of, of essential medical supplies that can't be done by individual GPs or, or cases across the board so they're, they're trying to, to deal with it on a larger scale. Okay any other points? I, I, was, I listened very carefully about the information issue and I'm, I'm conscious around I mean, of course, the government have got their plan, and we're not sure where that is in terms of 
uh, provision of information. And I just feel that, I mean, colleagues, uh, I don't want to bounce you into anything, but I want you to put your thinking caps on and we'll work this one outside. But in our advice to the Mayor, we may say that we need to counter incorrect information mm -hmm. uh, that may cause more problems than what it is. Yeah. Life is already challenging. I, you know, I am a politician, but dare I say, can politicians give creditable information and would it be trusted or institutions? We've got to put our thoughts to it, but someone's got to do something, either if it's reinforcing government information or if local circumstances take place that people just don't stand around like lemons they move into that information mm -hmm. vacuum and correct it where they can mm -hmm. um, and I'm mindful that we might write to the mayor on that issue and we might come back to you okay. further because clearly it's not your responsibility to do that but of, of course you're very conscious of it from the way that you've answered some of our questions yeah, we would, around... We would also, if there yeah. was an incident, then there would it would flip into it's a responsibility. Yeah. So I think that that's where the division yeah. is. But we would want to get accurate information out to people as quickly yeah. as possible. So if there isn't a problem, we'd want people to be informed very quickly. If the... I mean, either, either way, you'd want people to be informed about whether or not there was yeah. a problem and what they should do about it. I think we should think about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll think outside the meeting, but we definitely would come okay. back to you um, if we're going to offer any advice to the Mayor on that issue. Can I thank you very much uh, for the way and thank you for the work that you're doing on behalf of Londoners. Um, and we're obviously, depending on the situation, we probably will have you back. See you I think again the soon. way certain things <laughs> are and see what our. Uh, developing it and hopefully we get to a view of where government can share its work in a more transparent way to for us to enable us to be more effective thank, thank you. you thank you now our next topic is uh, EU exit impact on EU structural funding um, we have uh, Alex Conway, who's the Assistant Director of Brexit and European Programmes, GLA, who we've had before us. He's making his way down. Richard Parks, who's the Founder and Chairman of Renova. I hope I've pronounced that right, but no doubt I'll be corrected. And Joy Elliott Bowman, Director of Policy and Development of the Independent... No, sorry, that's not... Is it? No, it's those two, isn't it? Is it Richard? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I might have the wrong... You've got Simon, Alex, Richard and Sonali. Sorry, just bear with me. I'm not guessing. Simon, you've got down. I'm reading the wrong set of papers, which would be helpful if I had it in front of me. <laughs> I've now got it. It's my fault entirely. Uh, so, now welcome. Let's start again. So in panel three, let's, it's Simon Pitt Keefley, if I Done, yes. Thank you. Elite Business Manager, Champion for Small Businesses and Chair of the London ESIF Committee. Alex Conway, who's already been before us as Assistant Director of Brexit and European Programmes at the GLA. Uh, Richard Parks, Founder and Chairman of Renova. Uh, and Sonia Paraka, and I think you've been before yes, us before, yes. Head of Policy of Federations and Small Businesses. Welcome. Uh, we've got a set of questions that we want to put to you and we just want to restate where we think we were and we know that programmes are protected to a degree but we just might want to cover some ground where you are. Over to Assembly Member Boff. Uh, thank you very much. Can I ask um, what value uh, financial and non-financial does London receive from ESF and ERDF funding? Sure, can I take that? Thank you. Um, yes, so we, uh, London uh, has 748 million euro share of England's uh, ESIF, European Structural Investment Fund programmes. Obviously these are managed by uh, City Hall and overseen by LEAP. Uh, and these programmes operate across all 28 uh, member states, uh, and the poorest countries benefit from the largest programmes. In sterling at current rates, the €748 million Euro translates to €508 million uh, for ESF and €148 million for ERDF. 
but because both programs are match funded, we tend to talk about one point, roughly 1.4 billion pounds over the seven years. Um, and that's a substantial amount of money, of course. It is. Yeah. Uh, how prepared are we in the capital for the potential loss of the SFER yeah, funding? And when will that loss take place? So government has committed to continue or to pick up um, the funding uh, through the current programme, so that goes until 2023. So until then, we should be fine, um, uh, which is reassuring. Um, but I think you raised probably the most salient point for me here, which is the is government has uh, indicated that they will have a thing called the UK Share Prosperity Fund, which will come in to replace this uh, European money. And what we've seen to date is a lack of clarity from government about how that's going to operate. Uh, we've, th th there has been suggestions there will be prospectuses and detail about that, but we, we still see it, so we can't know for sure how that's going to happen. But I think the big concern is that we're not a region anymore, we're part of the national program. And if you think about the current sort of um, political narrative, London is not popular, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Everybody hates mm -hmm. us, we don't care. Um, and if you think about um, recent activity uh, that government has undertaken, so they launched the Stronger Towns Fund, uh, which is £1.6 billion pounds earlier in the year. Um, London was excluded entirely from that scheme, which is not a good indicator. So, you know, if there's one thing I think all of us in this chamber and in the whole of London, and I would argue the whole of the country could agree on, is that we have to keep making sure that the value London provides to the rest of the, con the, rest of the UK economy is constantly in government's mind. Because if you if we don't get our fair share of that, it's not just London that suffers. Mm -hmm. And I think, think that we at LEAP, that the Mayor, the Assembly, I think we should all be doing all we can to try and keep that in government's mind when you think about the sort of political dynamic that this is being played out against. It's a similar argument to that, which we're, incidentally we've got a perfectly balanced committee here, 60, 40, I think, mm -hmm. in terms of pro, um, remain, remain, leave. Um, so it's rather <laughs> appropriate, really. Um, uh, is it not the same argument that was used by the Leave campaign, for example, that we, we should keep some more of the money that we raise locally? Um, I, I think, you know, wh whatever your opinion on Brexit, I think the concern here is not about whether government replaces EU money with an equivalent amount overall. Mm. It's how that's dispersed. Right, yeah. And how London fares, and I continue to make the point that that's not just but this is but a, a London specific point, it's a UK economy point. Yeah, it's a, it's a, this is the point which I think you know, you're, you're, you're probably preaching to the choir here yeah, in nice. terms that London, uh, you know, London needs uh, a very strong advocate in order to be able to get its fair share. Indeed. Um, how would uh, the future loss of uh, ESF and ERDF affect the GLA's adult education budget, which is, of course, very important to us. I might defer to my colleague Alex here and so to that if I may. So, the, uh, as uh, colleagues will know, the adult education budget has been devolved uh, to the GLA. Um, the European Social Fund is being used to match fund some adult education budget activity um, where appropriate, and where I think we're just about to sign off a big contract. So, my team, which is a separate team from that running the adult education budget, will sign a contract with that team, uh, you know, committing uh, you know, tens of millions of, uh, of pounds, which will help augment uh, the services um, they provide. One important thing to remember about uh, EU funding is that, you know, it's always uh, important that it's additional to sort of core funding. So, uh, to give an example of the kind of thing we can do with it, um, you know, you can fund, you can expand the funding of ESOL activity. I think one of the activities that the uh, GLA colleagues are proposing is to train ESOL teachers. So, you know, where, uh, you know, what GLA colleagues have done is looked at, you know, what you can do with the adult education budget, looked at what you can do with the European Social Fund, and have put proposals to us, which we and the, the Mayor and the LEAP have approved, uh, to match them. Uh, so clearly, if that funding is not replaced, uh, it won't be possible to do that work in future. You raised earlier um, 
the prospect of the concerns. We don't know where the money's, how the money's going to be organised. Is there any reason to suppose it won't be organised in the way it is, uh, currently organised? Because you don't get a cheque from the EU, do you? Um, you get a you get a cheque from the GLA, or you get a uh, from the Ministry of Housing, or the Department of Work and Pensions. These are all people who administer uh, EU funds at the moment. I, I think if if everything, well, Alex could talk more in detail about how the money arrives in whose bank account when, but mm. I think the the. the in theory, that's correct. It should be uh, like that. But if we look at the example I gave earlier, um, where a substantial amount of money was awarded in a way that you might expect to be dispersed reasonably similarly to the way that sort of money has been dispersed in the past, was actually allocated, London was completely excluded from it. And I think it's back to this point about, you know, L London plays in, a, in an interesting political way at the moment. Uh, I think it's always been true, you know, we're very big and there's resentments build up around that. But um, that's the concern, I think, that, that we don't know. Uh, and until we do know, it's very difficult to be reassured. And there are examples that would give us cause for concern. What, what kind of impact has uh, those funds been to date on, on the economy? And, and if, if that funding was to go, what, what, what do you think the effect would be? You say it's important. Well, give us an example. No, by all means. Yeah, so we do. Well, probably the best way to illustrate it is by looking at what the current seven-year programmes are in the process of achieving, and we've got a very good track record in London of uh, surpassing uh, the outputs we set out. So at the moment, the, pro the current programmes should help 400,000 Londoners into the labour market in some shape or form. It's a pretty big number. <laughs> helping 22,000 Londoners gain qualifications. That's up to NVQ level three. I think supporting, that's European social fund money, European regional development fund money, that's supporting uh, more than 10,000 small businesses. That might be with sort of business support, you know, to gu advice and guidance. It might be directly with cash uh, through, you know, the Greater London Investment Fund. Uh, you've got the Mayor's Energy Efficiency Fund looking to cut greenhouse gas emissions, uh, some 40,000 tonnes over the lifetime of the programme. So these are some pretty, have been some pretty effective, uh, you know, valuable, cost-effective outcomes. I'd say they typically benefit the most disadvantaged Londoners, uh, and they will vanish if not replaced. And actually, if, you, if I could just add to that, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's not just the value of the funds themselves, it's the additional funds they leverage. So the fact that the two European yeah. funds are both match-funded 50% doubles your, your money, and it enables people to do things they might not otherwise be able to do, but also the, the, the Greater London Investment Fund that, that Alex mentioned. That's a, a co-investment fund, so it's, it's equity as well as um, debt financing, and it's done with a partner that brings in a lot of additional cash that helps support those businesses in their early stages. So it's well, very that's substantial. On the, the economy side, the, the important... Uh, an important contribution. What about the general quality of life? And perhaps we can widen that question to our, our, uh, our other guests as well. What, what effect? Yeah, I'm happy to take it. I mean, um, <clears throat> I think probably my starting point is to say that it's worth bearing in mind the structural funds have been there for a long time. And you know, I've worked with them a long time, not sure whether it's as long as Alex, but a long time. Um, and so I, for instance, I, one way or another, my work has involved the structural funds at times over the last 25 years. And I think there's a huge amount of human capital built up uh, and the provider base and the networks that work in, in ESF and ERDF. Um, and as Alex has said, because of the requirement for that to be additional, so that's additional and different to the mainstream programmes that are there, that UK government finances or regional government implements. Um, and what, what that's meant, I think, is that you hear words like innovation and you see new people can try new things outside and uh, different to what mainstream programmes are there to do. The structural fronts were there to deal with market failures. So they're there to do with market failures in people, you know, human capital mm. uh, and the, on the ESF side, and they're to deal with market failures on the ESF side through business and competitiveness. And, um, and that those settlements are arrived at for London through a different kind of mechanism to the way UK decides where it puts its money in the regions. And those settlements recognise the deprivation in London, you know, and the, the, the structural issues in London's economy. So, you know, we have, as we all know, we have 
significant amounts of wealth and prosperity in London, and we have very, very severe disadvantage. And the greater the inclusion on the one side, the greater the exclusion felt by those who are, are left out of it on the other. And ESF, in terms of vocational education, training, skills, social inclusion, business support, competitiveness, they've all, those funds have always been additional. They've always been there with the specific focus of addressing those issues. So I'm not talking about the global amount of money, because in theory, one pot goes if, some, if the other goes in. The issue is, of course, what you do with that, assuming even pound for pound, it still, it still was there. And I'd say I think it's important to look at the way, that, the, the way those networks have been developed, the way people have been able to plan and work over six, seven year cycles. And that's not typical of government annual or biannual settlements. Um, and so, f for me, the identity of London around a lot of that work is what re really stands to lose if we're, if, unless there are very particular and specific ways in which that kind of identity is preserved through whatever comes after the structural funds. Yes. Um, from a smaller business perspective, um, obviously the amount of structural funds that go to um, each region within a nation and between, within the, between the nations within the UK varies. When we've surveyed our members, um, London and the South East, in terms of the proportion of businesses, smaller businesses that are actually applied for the structural funds were at the lower end. I think the figure for London was 9% relative to say 32 percent of small businesses in northern ireland or 26 percent of small businesses in wales or 25 percent of smaller businesses in yorkshire and the humber um, now if we look at the effect of that uh, funding on smaller businesses when we asked our small businesses who had directly applied for the structural funds in one form or another um 68 percent of them felt that the structural funds had had a positive impact upon their business. 64% felt that the structural funds had had a positive impact upon their local area because there are a lot of indirect benefits that smaller businesses can also capitalise upon. But that's not to say that there aren't improvements that could be made. So, for example, of those of our smaller businesses that had not applied for the EU structural funds, 44% basically said that largely that's because they didn't know that the structural funds existed. Um, of those that had applied, 48%, almost half, said that you know there were some problems in the in, in the process. Whether that was in terms of having to provide a little bit too much information up front, or slightly onerous reporting requirements, or perhaps they found finding match funding um, challenging, and therefore felt that the system or the way that the funds worked bias was biased towards those small businesses that already had strong social capital and could find match funders. And some were quite concerned about the way that clawback. Um, could operate if they fail to achieve certain outputs at certain points, if they were successful in receipt of the funding. So there are definitely improvements that could potentially be made. Um, we, like a lot of others, are awaiting the consultation on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which does in some ways represent an opportunity um, to sort of reimagine um, the business support landscape. Obviously, we have certain prerequisites that we would like to see, and um, we would want to, you know, self obviously want to ensure that the level of um, funding that is uh, spent on business support is not diminished in the UK Shared Prosperity Fund relative to the structural funds. Um, you know, ideally, we would like to see that, that figure go up. We also think that um, those, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund needs to maintain um, a specific focus, a specific access on you know, helping enhance SME competitiveness. So that's the third axis of the ERD fund funding. Um, and perhaps also think about, you know, um, should it also prioritise um, funding for smaller businesses in less favoured areas, as defined, say, by the indices of multiple deprivation. But there's also an opportunity, perhaps, to look at how we measure success um, as a consequence of funding being allocated. At the moment, there's a lot of bias towards job creation. That's sort of seen very much as you know the biggest indicator that the funding has been used successfully. We perhaps think that this is an opportunity to look in a more nuanced way at a variety of indicators of success, and that could range from social impact on communities, productivity, um, decarbonisation, modernisation more generally. There is an opportunity to look again at how we evaluate the successful use of the funding. 
So you think there's, there's going to be an opportunity, that there are opportunities here for more discretion to be exercised? We think that, yeah, there, there is an opportunity to learn from okay. um, some of the challenges that the managing authorities may have experienced in the way that they've distributed the ERDF and the um, European Social Fund and to look again at, at how we can sort of develop a funding streams that perhaps are a little bit more complementary, um, a little bit less bureaucratic. Yeah. Um, and as I well, said, you know, the way that you measure success, if that can be in a more nuanced or more granular way, as opposed to purely being defined or predominantly being defined by job creation. But aren't we largely making the decisions ourselves already now? I remember lobbying with Steve Bullock in 1992. In, the, in 1992, in another life, I think we were lobbying yeah, the we, London Councils. It wasn't it. called. Oh, it was called London Councils. Yeah, then. London Boroughs yeah, Association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And we went on. A, me and Steve Bullock represented the two associations and went to went to Brussels to start lobbying them to, for structural funds yeah. for some of the boroughs. I think Greenwich's got some of that money actually. And we we. Um, we, uh, we lobbied, it was a hard, we went from plush office to plush office, trying to persuade people, trying to see the right people to persuade them. And at the end of the day, we were told actually the best people to go to uh, was an office in Victoria. Um, and, 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 and because that's where the decisions actually were made, because it, they weren't, those, those granular decisions were not made in Brussels, they, they were made much more locally. But what was more important, that argument that London should access the fund, because at yeah. that stage it wasn't, and mm. the lobbying that went on that allowed can, us to do that. Can you understand that London's economy probably isn't in as much need as, say, the North East, in term, or the North West, isn't <laughs> in as much need for structural funds? Mm. Is, is, is that a reasonable thing to say? Well, I... I'll, so, so I would say, so if you look at our... We were actually very unusual. So one of the weird things the government did with this programme this time round was they kind of invited left areas to say, well, we've got a national amount of EIDF and a national amount of ESF. Tell us how much you want. And their sort of expectation was, I think, that most people would go down the line 50-50 or would prefer ERDF. Right. Uh, and we were very... We threw their figures into confusion because we said we wanted... 75% European Social Fund. And that reflects the fact that London, actually this has changed in the last few years, but historically, you know, London's employment rate has sort of barely ever changed. There's always you know, a hard core of people that are far removed from the labour market. And it felt to us, and you know, we consulted everybody, including the Assembly colleagues, who talked about what, you know, where to set the, draw the line, but that seemed a sensible thing. So I think we'd always make the case that the European Social Fund is more important to London than the European Regional Development Fund, but that both play their roles. I wouldn't dispute anything Sonali said, by the way, about the possibilities of making funds less bureaucratic or indeed having a sort of single pot and so on. Those are all good things that you could do. Uh, and we know that colleagues in Whitehall are working on these ideas. It's just a matter of whether anything ever comes to fruition. So really what we're talking about here, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it's fair to say, Ms. Perrette, that, that if, if all those funds disappeared, it would be it would be tough on, on London small businesses. Um, Absolutely. Um, yeah. The ERDF funding provide, you know, allows for the provision of free training, mentoring. Um, it allows for grants to be given to small businesses that can range between 20k to 1k. Um, as well as a, a sort of really facilitating the provision of loan finance. So we would not want to see that stop without a replacement being sure. ready but to... You, you, you don't see a prospect of that alone. happening. You don't see a prospect of that happening, do you? Just the more being withdrawn, it's going to be... No, no, I mean, the, the government has, through its no-deal notices, in the event of a no-deal scenario, yeah. um, set out clearly the money allocated within the 2014 to 2022 programme commitments made will be honoured okay, and that is incredibly important but we are awaiting the consultation on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund um, and a chance to input into that to see what a replacement arrangement would look like and a lot will depend obviously on the you know for example our relationship with Horizon 2020 a lot will depend upon the nature of our future relationship with the EU. Already some, uh, already some of the, uh, not so much, well, they are small businesses, some of the training providers have changed, haven't they, and moved out and, um, you know, have caused some problems for, for, 
for people in receipt of training because of the uncertainty of where they are. I mean, I've had some casework around on it uh, about some companies, whether rightly or wrongly, providing stuff pulled out, were working with others in partnership and left a gap. Um, so, so there are some real issues here, but it really goes back to how do we influence the new arrangements mm -hmm. and will it meet London's needs post 2023 if we're clear about what London needs are isn't it and the impact is is about small business it's about the community led sector um, because some of them are community based schemes of where they are um, ERDF well I, you know I think it is worth battling for and I do think London has some needs for it but uh, you can see that being lost in the wider issues of that uh, regionalism and what the perception of London is. So there are some important issues here to go. Where, where is... Um, so I, you know, not saying my post bag, I'm, I pander to every lobbying issue. I don't see any coalitions coming back and saying, Len Duval, London Assembly member, we want you to start raising this issue uh, and going to government or even saying to the mayor, go to the government, even though we've written to the mayor and said this is what you should be doing, um, about these issues. Is that because it's not the right time to do that now? Um, or are we comfortable where civil servants are in drafting up approaches, but already we've lost out on one aspect? Uh, should we not be coming together and saying, well, actually, if there's a new fund going, we want to start beating the drum for London. And where are we, and what are we going to do about it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, uh, the I did um, uh, present to a, a, a full uh, committee. I think. I'm, forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm not very good with the names. But, uh, but a group of all assembly members yeah. um, and made that specific point that we we must be doing this together. Um, and I think that uh, the mayor and London councils wrote to government back in 2017 about this. Um, the business members of LEAP have written to government with the mayor about this. Um, I, but I think we could be doing a lot more. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've certainly not been shy in trying to promote that. Uh, and I think it really is time that we, we, we come together. Right. And, and, I, and I, I, I think you'll have allies in that. And, you know, I mean, it's probably something not within the remit of this committee that we'll probably need to mm. call you back again to talk about how we can best make the case for London. Because the case for London definitely needs to be made. Because and it's it not, it's, it's, forgive me, but it's not a difficult case to make. Yeah. I mean, you know, Richard touched on the point about London's need. Um, I think, you know, it's easy to forget that London has as much need as everybody else, at least, in terms of uh, people with lower levels of social capital that need the support. Um, London is also the engine of the UK economy. It's not true to say that you take a pound out of London and invest it somewhere else, you get the same return. You absolutely do not pound invested in London benefits the UK economy as a whole. And thirdly, the innovation point that, again, Richard made, that, that, that this is where small businesses innovate, grow, and do things that benefit the UK economy as a whole. And I do think that's the, that's the key part of it. It's not a London-centric we want, we need. It's, you know, we all need this key part of the network that is the UK economy to continue to do its job as best as it can. So, uh, what, what what kind of features should the UK uh, Share Prosperity Fund have that will benefit? Uh, benefit? So, so, so we, as Simon alluded to earlier, actually back in December 2017, now uh, the Mayor and the Chair of London Councils wrote jointly to governments when the UK SPF had been first announced and said. Here are our proposals for how that fund should work. I think we shared that with the Assembly at the time. And, I, and indeed, I think Assembly colleagues also, like let members, wrote in support of it. Um, I don't believe any of those proposals from December 2017 would have changed substantively, to be honest. It's about devolving funding to an appropriate level and having funding of an appropriate quantum uh, and simplifying its management. Um, we're happy to share that again. Um, I, mean, I think the next key step is, you know, government has now and I was just looking, there's a research document that's appeared in the House of Commons Library, which gave the number of times the government has announced it's going to consult on UK SPF and not done it. Uh, you know, it's, it's you know, 18 months overdue now. So, and there's still, still no sign, to be frank, uh, when it's going to come out. So either at some point in the next few months it will be produced, in which case we can all then respond collectively, uh, or even if it's not produced, we may be reaching a point with structural fund programmes uh, are now 
both ERDF and ESF, if you take into account what we've already contracted and what's in our pipeline, they're nearly 90% committed to one of the most successful um, let areas when it comes to committing funds. So we haven't got much left to give out. And you know, once we're out, there's nothing mm -hmm. to replace it. So, so that so might be another peg to hang the uh, so argument. Here's, here's an opportunity for actually changing the, the attitude of government towards, towards London. Um, well, I should say, by the way, we, we do have a fair, we've got a good rep, I think it's fair to say, among kind of civil service colleagues. We are the only, City Hall is the only team that manages these funds, uh, the only non-civil service team that manages these funds in England, and we've done a pretty good job. So there's no, at, on the part of civil servants, there's no aspiration to kind of remove that. They see that that works and that, you know, it wouldn't be a good look to devolve backwards. I mean, it may just be that political discussion we've already alluded to about about quantum. Yeah. Well, there certainly seems to be loads of money around at the moment, uh, you know, from the Chancellor's statement. Anyone would think there was an election going on. Um, so now that austerity is gone, um, apparently. Um, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Assembly Member Pigeon. I'm just wondering what discussions, Alex, you are having with um, other, other devolved structures, such as Wales, Scotland, where they presumably have these funds. Um, to try to influence what's going on in government? Uh, we, we, fun, we do. We, we, um, my colleague was just talking to Scottish colleagues uh, yesterday, and I got a letter a couple of months ago, I think, from the National Assembly of Wales asking us to set out what our proposals were, and I sent them that information. So we're all on the sort of same side here. I think one of the reasons, uh, I don't think it's telling tales out of school, that the UK Share Prosperity Fund has not uh, happened yet is that the devolved administrations were not particularly taken with the idea. Uh, because, of course, at the moment, Scotland, Wales and Northern Irish governments have more or less total control. They are the managing authorities of European structural funds. Here in City Hall, we're just an intermediate body, which is one step down. Mm. Um, so um, we're very much on the same side when it comes to not having some totally top-down Whitehall uh, mechanism. And I think that's well understood uh, among officials uh, who, who I do meet with. Well, that's an interesting point, because we do some work with the scrutiny bodies mm -hmm. of those uh, devolved organisations, and maybe that's one where we would follow up and see what we can do. Mm -hmm. Look, just in terms of that conversation, I think we can do better. 2017, but now 2019, we are on the verge of a general election at some time this year. I think we can safely bet my house when, but sometime this year it's going to happen. Um, we need to be ready for when that new government's in, really, with a bit more of a plan. So what we may do is, again, we're going to come back to you on some of those issues and um, that, uh, that. I get, if, uh, if Alec, you can remind us of where it is. We'll chase up what economy did or didn't do. I think we need to write to the mayor. I think we need to be doing more, mm -hmm. you know, equally, you know, a letter to every new London MP, regardless of party saying this is what if you don't start asking some questions or where it is you're going to get rolled over yeah. because of perceptions of London and we need to battle together and we need to try and get the all party bit going because then mm. and certainly different sectors and work with people that are making issues and see where there is common cause because unless we say it we're going to lose by default you know I think that's I think where that's, we are that's, that's absolutely right we and need I a think plan yeah, and, and also I think that we perhaps could do more to include the voice of business in that yeah, lobby because I think, I think that does have yeah. additional weight with government at the moment. I think that's that's yeah. really important. We certainly should be a feature. Okay, yeah. I, I think that would be an interesting one. We go to back to the mayor again. If the you know I think the mayor would be willing to do it. The assembly is actually looking to undertake different campaigns, and if need be, the assembly can adopt it. Uh, and start doing it and working with others, but I think the mayor would want to join in. But we need to, we need some real shake-up, heavy duty. We're beyond the letters now, aren't we? Because mm. look, if things happen, whenever, you know, even if it was got to January or February, something is going to give. Um, either way, we're hopefully certainty if ever that word ever existed uh, in the environment we work in. Um, we need to get our act together, I think. Silence is not a good thing. Well, you know. um, any further questions? Can, can I thank you for the way that you've... 
answer our questions and we'd definitely come back to you and um, certainly like your ideas about how you think business is. We know of the business organisations, but what you think how uh, would be best use business to get that voice in? You, you obviously do it yourselves, but how do we do it collectively? But thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, and now we're coming to our last session which is really uh, in terms of the impact around the higher education sector, which we've, we've only discussed sort of in general terms, but we've never uh, had some expert advice uh, in terms of our conversations. So we're just real during the seating arrangements. And can I welcome Joint Elliot Bowman, Director of Policy and Development of the Independent Higher Education, um, Professor Dame Ellen Wallace, Fellow British Academy, and Professor David Maguire, Vice Chancellor, University of Greenwich and London Higher member. And I presume London Higher is the university association body on London yes okay thank you uh, welcome um, we've got a set of questions but I think it's probably appropriate just to for this issue because we've not done this before mm. to just because um, we obviously have been following some of the issues of higher education and you know brexit issues and we you know we've heard some pronouncements from government but not quite clear where whether they're just nice words or they're actual practical actions. Do you want to set the scene for us? Mm -hmm. And then we are, it might shape some of the questions that my, my colleague is about to ask you. So who wants to go? Can I go? Well, um, thank you for the invitation to attend this afternoon. I think without question, um, Britain leaving the European Union without a deal causes a significant number of problems for higher education and universities in, in London. The, will affect a number of the things that we do. It will impact our ability to do research and to compete with other universities around the world. It will have a, a traumatic impact on our uh, educational activities, the ability to bring students to the UK to contribute to the talent pool and to support our universities. And it will also affect our ability to interact with local uh, businesses and to um, develop our community links as well. Um, just by way of, of, of numbers, uh, there's probably around half a billion pounds at risk to university funding um, should we leave the university in an uncontrolled way. I say at risk because it's likely, for example, that some of those students who are coming to study in our universities and getting access to student uh, loans will come as international students and will pay uh, fees. There are... Um, around 37,000 European Union students studying in London at the present time, and around 13,800 staff from the European Union are working in our universities. And taking those out will have a major impact on the talent pool that we have at our disposal, and will, uh, it will be significantly detrimental to the work that we do. Can I put a slightly different take on it? Because there's a lot of agitation which David rightly reflects about the potential Ab sudden absence disappearance of money we've been accustomed to. That's not the most likely scenario because we know that there are government guarantees, as you've already talked about with the structural fund, to fill the gap hmm. on an interim basis. The question is much more difficult about what happens later. And from my perspective, I think we need to think not just about the quantity of the EU sourced money, but its quality. And UK higher education institutions have been hugely successful in winning the competition for those awards. It's a competitive process, not an allocation process, because of the quality of those higher education institutions. And that includes all the way through, from undergraduates, graduate students, very important, lab assistants, and the, the, the fancy research faculty who are professors and so forth. And what's, we may get substitute money, and indeed the encouragement from yesterday's announcements about the spending review, about maintaining commitment to science funding, 
But what's really important is that successor or replacement money gives the same recognition to UK institutions that they are amongst the best in the world and that the criteria for any substitute funding include record kite marking on international competition. It's not just to say that the University of Greenwich is one of the best institutions in the UK, but you want to say it's one of the best in the world. Um, and that whatever funding might come in its place would include provisions for facilitating and encouraging international collaboration, international networking, mobility, inwards and outwards, so we can incubate talent from other countries and so that our bright youngsters have the opportunity to gain extra experience and depth in other countries. And I think that, that long-term planning is actually very important for, for, for the part of the sector that I represent. And, and they, are, they are not the big universities, they are the small. They are, we were talking about small businesses before. Um, so, you know, 55% of independent higher education providers have less than 500 students. So they are very much tiny businesses um, offering very specialist programming. And what they are worried about is that long-term EU staff. Um, they have employment contracts that very much rely on having a part-time industry and a part-time teaching role. That keeps them connected to their industries, that keeps their staff. We don't have big research grant funding, we rely on having that relationship with industry and having our staff having that relationship with industry. There is no visa that gives you two part-time jobs. So, in a, you know, depending on, obviously, the, the freedom of movement and, and what happens moving forward with the visa system, it would have to be a fundamental change to be able to keep that level of connectivity and the reliance on EU staff that we do have. And even if we were to say, well, we can fill those roles with British staff, that's cutting us off from the EU community. You know, the London Institute of Banking and Finance would not be, pretty, would be pleased if they could only hire British bankers to work in their, in their institutes. So there is this, this kind of professional and industry linkage that a lot of higher education providers have, specifically the specialist ones, um, that would be lost if we, if we moved into, into that model. And then again, thinking long term, um, you know, it's right to think for the universities um, that the EU students could, could move into the visa system, pay the higher fees. But actually for many small providers, um, and, and, and you know, including the Royal Academy, who, who teaches about 25 students in their each co year cohort, they don't have the funds, they don't have a tier four license, they don't have the, the, the money and the resources to invest in something like that. So actually, without e, the EU freedom of movement, they will have no students from outside of the UK whatsoever. And I can tell you the Royal Academy has no interest in being the Royal Academy of Britain. And that also <laughs> then has a knock-on effect on their charitable donations. So many of our members are charities, and they rely on that linkage with Europe to be able to then bring in charitable donations from their industries, particularly the creative industries, um, to bring that back in. So if no EU students, no EU charity, charity donations. Um, and that will have a huge impact. And so we're thinking very much on the, the, the money that we tangibly can see, and we'll replace that now. But what we're not thinking is about some of these things that are hidden underneath the surface, and what will be the impact on, on, on our uh, organisations. And 60% of all independent higher education providers in the country are in London. Mm. And 80% are London in the southeast, which means that you have London students travelling nearby to get to them, Guildford, Kent, etc. So you have a substantial amount of this entire sector right here in London, which will be affected. I mean, can I just add on that? The contribution that they make to creative industries, as Joy has said, and to the cultural dynamism of London and the wider community is terribly important. Mm -hmm and are not well recognised by Dominic Cummings, who thinks we shouldn't be helping ballet dancers. Mm. Um, Assemblymember Pigeon. Indeed, indeed. And it's really interesting just to get that wider context, because, it, you know, my first question, at one level, it's the quantity, quality point that you're making. But my first question was really about the potential impact of the loss of EU funding, and I was looking specifically at programmes Horizon 2020, this huge research and innovation program where we've had disproportionately high um, percentage of funding compared to other member states we've been successful there but also things like Erasmus plus but these are obviously the more obvious ones rather than the ones joy you were talking about but what, what's the impact of that going to be on London's higher um, education institutions I say a word about horizon mm. 2020 first maybe David probably more in touch with Erasmus than I am Horizon 2020 
UK, hugely successful, has won, ranked second mm. across the EU member states. London institutions taking a quarter mm. of the share of what's won. Very impressive. Horizon 2020 has a guarantee from the government mm. that there will be substitute funding, but that only lasts till the end of Horizon 2020 is only another year. We are in total dark about what would follow with the next research framework programme, Horizon Europe, where the presumption would be that we're a third country. Mm. And therefore, the issue will be what kind of relationship as a third country is potentially open to us. On that, two things. Depending on whether we have a, a, a harsh exit or a softer exit, if we have a very harsh exit, no deal scenario with the UK not meeting its financial liabilities and so on, we can't expect very generous treatment no. from the EU of 27 about successor arrangements. And we already know the Swiss are suffering terribly, not being able to complete their research negotiations until they've got a framework agreement. There's a lot of cut and pasting going on between the way the UK is likely to be treated and the way Switzerland is being treated. The Swiss discussion is currently frozen. They started that discussion in 2014. That's five years ago. Mm, mm. So we can't expect if we just... And, I mean, Switzerland's not such a difficult country to deal with. It has a very thriving higher education and research sector. If we have a softer exit, then we would probably be given more opportunity for a, a more amenable association, but then it would be on a pay-as-you-go basis, mm -hmm. um, depending on what the UK taxpayer was prepared to put into the pot. And would you have then any influence over the structure of the programme in the way that you do now? I mean, that's a really important question. I mean, if, if we are on a softer basis, something like the withdrawal agreement that Theresa May negotiated, um, the UK would be part of the system but without a, an explicit voice, mm. um, with or without some quasi-observer status. Down the road... Who knows? The Norwegians are very active in all the programme committees and do their best um, because they're outside associates. Um, we have to wait and see. Not, not terribly, terribly easy. What we at the British Academy have done very deliberately, and I think it's true of some other British-based organisations, is to work extremely closely with opposite numbers in other member states in the hope that then British thinking, for example, about the next framework programme would be fed in. It's terribly convenient that the chairman yes. of that international working group is a British professor. Mm. So you're trying to work with your exactly privileges so. in other countries exactly. to try and influence stuff exactly. with all this going yeah. on still. Um, David, what about um, whether you've got any comments on Horizon 2020 Erasmus? Mm -hmm. Well, just to put the... I agree with everything that uh, Helen has to say, has had to say, incidentally. Uh, just to put it in context, um, London universities, on average, have received about £200 million a year mm -hmm. over the last few years from Horizon 2020, the fund research. But beyond that, it gives us access to the ability to collaborate with the best top talent all around Europe. And of course, many of today's problems are hugely difficult and can only be contractable if we work with the best talent around the world, including that in our European um, partners. So that's a really important part uh, 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 dimension for that collaboration. Um, and one of the key principles that Britain believes in is that funding from Horizon 2020 should be provided on an excellent, excellence basis, i.e. the best projects in Europe get funded. And we have a bit of a concern that we're not in the inner circle of making decisions about the programme. Other people in other parts of Europe who don't have the same excellent universities and researchers that we have will choose other criteria to distribute the funds, like, you know, Buggins Turn or based on the square meterage of country or, or population <laughs> or, 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 or whatever. So that's um, my observations in addition to Helen's on Horizon 2020. Uh, turning to uh, Erasmus, that's a program which allows students and staff to go on exchanges with other universities around Europe. Europeans come to Britain, British uh, staff and students go elsewhere. 
um, we received about Europe, uh, sorry, London received about six to seven million euros mm -hmm. of funding uh, last year, which allowed around 2,000 students and 450 staff from Britain to go on these visits to build up collaborative relationships. And it's these relationships, of course, which underpin our place in Europe that allow us to jointly bid for Horizon 2020 and other structural and uh, European uh, funds and to keep us up to date with what's the leading edge ideas in and around uh, Europe. So they're really important uh, for London universities. Mm. And in terms of um, London's higher education in institutions, they obviously contribute significant value to the London economy, which as we know and we heard earlier, then has huge implications for the UK yep. economy. Um, so what are the implications of this if we leave the EU with a no deal? Have you done any work on that? Well, I think we've covered a lot of that already. I think at risk, as I said earlier, is about half a billion pounds worth of uh, funding. Mm -hmm. About 200 million have arisen in funding, about 300 million in student fees. But remember, each of those students that uh, spends money also spends their own hard-earned money mm -hmm. on accommodation, on uh, uh, transport, on food, on substance, and other things. So you can probably double that 300 million to make it 600 million of, mm. of spend into their capital. Yeah. And of course, a lot of small and medium-sized businesses around the capital rely directly on that, on that funding. And then there's the rich cultural uh, uh, influences that they, they have in, in civilized our society and help with community cohesion and all, all those other great things that, that people bring to London. And the, the, um, in terms of the student spend, the, the, there's a survey that's done on students every year and it's estimated that they, each student will spend at least £15,000 in a given year um, in London. So you have, if, you, if, you know, if they're paying the fee, then on top of that they're spending £15,000. And then research by, by London Economics and Oxford Economics then puts multipliers on that um, for tourism. Uh, they then attract friends and family. So, so there is a compound effect of mm. any student that comes to the UK from outside of the UK. I mean, just as there's a compound effect, you know, students from Yorkshire will bring their family down <laughs> to visit, et cetera. But you know, that, that, is a, that is a massive impact. Mm. If you think about um, the spaces that we have in London that are, are reliant on students, you think with the districts and the areas that then there's businesses and taxis and, and so on that, that kind of focus around them. Um, and I think that the, the question very much about how will we replace that um, is, is not one that's necessarily been thought of. And, and we market really heavily. The UK has, has target countries that we put funds in to market to bring these students mm -hmm. here. There's no money to market to European students. None. Whatsoever. Currently, there's no government investment in that. There's no intention to invest in that. The British Council's given funding, and they're specifically told not to work in Europe. So whilst we've, we know that we're going to potentially lose, you know, for our, our sector, 14% of all of our students in this in, in, in EU exit, we're not, as, as a government, putting any money into then recruiting those students back. In fact, it's been the bodies, the Universities UK, ourselves, uh, the colleges who've been putting money into going to convince our, our, our European counterparts, please do keep sending your students here or, or to convince students to keep coming. But there's not been any planning for how we're going to attract students now that they won't be able to get student loans, they won't have access to lower f uh, fees. So we've, we've no plan, really, to go and, and recruit those students back. And that's what's most concerning, uh, the fact that we're two months away from that point. I mean, perhaps I can add in this context, there's been a shocking decline in foreign language competence amongst natives of the United Kingdom. And there is a, an expectation that the UK is still going to be global Britain and operate in the world. And if you're going to be global Britain, you need to be able to operate multilingually, both in your employment base here. There are a lot of um, businesses that are conducted on a multilingual basis because it can be recruited. Here. And people in other parts of the world also talk foreign languages. Um, and it might be helpful, if, for example, if you want to expand your activities in Latin America to etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And the Erasmus programme has been incredibly helpful. In both in developing the language competences of UK students, but also bringing uh, students from other countries as Erasmus students who are then language assistants, actually language assistants on the cheap in British higher education institutions. And they also provide a level of ambition. So you will have a lot of, of students who study high level voca highly vocational degrees that won't do Erasmus. You know, they're here to, to get an occupation and to, and, and to go back to work. And they come from the London boroughs who are, are less likely to see 
a lot of um, European cultural diversity within them. And, and uh, we've heard from, from our members and from other uh, similar institutions that you know, bringing in um, Erasmus students from Italy into a hairdressing program means that they, these students all of a sudden have an ambition to think, well, could I start hairdressing in Italy? Could I look more globally? You know, you don't see a lot of hairdressing students on Erasmus programs, so it requires you know <laughs> Europe sending students here to really raise the ambition of our students to think about language, think about being global in their outlook, um, even in a vocational course. So it's a really interesting mix that I think we it's very difficult to quantify, but we won't know it until we lose it when we see the drop in ambition of our students to be global in their outlook. And. Um, We've already touched on um, the uh, ending of freedom of movement and the impact that will have on your staff and students. I don't know if you want to expand a bit more on that and also um, the government is sort of talking about a new skills-based immigration system if the UK does leave the EU. How will this affect your ability to recruit and retain staff and students? Well, it's, 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 it's a worry, without, without question. The government have made some um, announcements about uh, future visas, but we don't know uh, the long-term uh, details. A current concern is that most uh, students uh, who want to come and study after we leave uh, the EU will only get access to a three-year visa. That's a problem because, firstly, some of the courses are longer than three years. If you want to do medicine or veterinary science mm. or a, a four-year uh, integrated master's programme. They're all belong more than three years, so, so how does that work? We don't know. Um, and uh, what about if students need to come back and repeat or um, go on gap years or uh, overseas uh, study if they're doing foreign mm -hmm. language on? How does that all, all work? So that's a, that's a challenge. Um, there's also um, a wish for many people who come to study in, in Britain to be able to work in what's called post-study mm -hmm. uh, work. And that's been a major constraint in our ability in this country to attract students from all over the, the world. And so any visa in the, in the future we, for European students, we would wish to have that included as well. In terms of staff, well, that's also a, a, a huge challenge. Around 25% of the academic staff who work in our universities in London come from the European Union. One quarter of the talent which makes our universities amongst the mm -hmm. best in the world, are from Europe. And just thinking about how we would recruit that talent pool should they not wish or not be able to work in, in Britain any, any longer after we leave. Now, of course, not all of those will leave on, on, on day one, so I don't want to overstate the problem, but non nonetheless, it is a really important resource and something which we, we need to continue to nurture and support and encourage to make Britain their home and Britain their preferred a destination of, of work. They are amongst the best uh, people that we have. So can I just check on the 25%? Is that all staff or is that academic it's staff? It's 25% of, of, of academic staff. Of academic. Uh, 9,800. And there are around 12% uh, around of non-academic staff, yeah. making a total of about 13,800 yeah. university employees from the European Union. And it's more than 25% in some institutions. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, can I, can I add that... Um, I mean, the, the issues for students and faculty are all very important. The current chief of staff of the current prime minister is very keen on persuading the Home Office to be more flexible in developing a migration system that's welcoming to super scientists from wherever they come to. And we'll see how that discussion goes. Um, Dominic Cummings has asked for advice from people and inputs on that, um, in which context he also repeated the remark that this was not intended to recruit more ballet dancers, which is <laughs> obviously a thing of his. Um, but let me add that it's, it's not only the superstars that are important. Part of the success of UK HEIs across the whole of the EU programme has been its success in incubating talent incubating talent of, of whether of UK origin students or other Europeans coming to the UK and being able to spread their wings and that's really important mm. and another thing which is extremely important is whether or not and this is particularly for faculty level people the new immigration system will 
enable people to bring their family dependents mm. with them, yeah. which is a familiar problem in other migration contexts. And one of the very attractive features for e other EU <laughs> nationals has been that until now, freedom of movement has enabled them to bring an elderly parent or whatever to the country. Mm. You, sorry. Uh, have you, no, so in fine. your lobbying of government, do you think they're listening? Do you think, or, you know, in that sense of some of the issues that you outlined? So I can see a couple of plus points here. I'm thinking, OK, I'm leaving the EU, but I need to think of what the selling points as I start talking around internationally. And yeah, yeah, you've got to be a big selling point of why someone will want to do a trade agreement or all those issues of what you could put in and, you know, in terms of negotiation issues and, and those. But I think we need to be fair to government in this context because the officials who deal with these things are currently working very hard on developing options. Mm. There's a review led by Adrian Smith, which is the publication of which is imminent on alternative ways of thinking about it. And I think we know both from the recent past and the immediate present that both officials and ministers currently, although we've just lost a minister today, we've just lost the minister for <laughs> yeah. universities and research, and who knows who'll follow Joe. Um, but the, there's recognition that a vibrant research community is very, very important for the dynamism of the British economy and British society. And as you were saying in the earlier panel, London plays a hugely important part in that, although, of course, it's not, it's not the whole of the UK. So, yes, I do think there's listening and there's consultation with key stakeholders, UUK and so on and so forth, as well as the Academy, doing the best they can to make it. And this is why I say it's not just about the money. I think we get fixated on the money. It's yeah. about what the money is used for and what it recognises. Okay. And there are ministers, and there are ministers who understand their brief. Well, and then that's there what was the a minister is. who understood it, but he's no longer the minister. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and his predecessor certainly understood it as well. I think that there's, there's a lot that can't be planned for, and that's part of the issue. So, mm. so one of the questions that DFE civil servants have asked us recently is about the impact of the lack of free movement on courses. So if you have a course that's highly industry-based, you might say, OK, well, part of your course is to go and work in Germany for a term mm. um, and then come back. Of course, that course will have to change if students can no longer go and do that. Um, and equally, if students who are coming from the EU can no longer work here, if a course requires a domestic level of, of employment. And that's particularly the case for, for many of our members who are uh, highly entrepreneurial courses, the gig economy, creative artists. You actually cannot start your own business in a, on a tier four visa. You are not permitted to do anything that's viewed as self-employment. So these are the, uh, the unseen. So they're saying, well we'll, well, we'll have a visa system, don't worry. But mm -hmm. then underneath that, you say, well, your visa system doesn't allow self-employment. And if I've got a bunch of creative artists, I'm not going to get a job for 20 hours a week you know, uh, as, a, as a ballet dancer. That's going to be a gig economy. So they can't actually do that then while they're studying here. So there's a, there's a compound effect that they're not seeing that kind of, or they're not able to affect that, that under layer. And that goes for staff as well. You know, so they are saying, well, don't worry, we'll be able to move some of these staff onto the Tier 2 visa. Well, the Tier 2 visa doesn't allow for two part-time jobs. So any, any contract or any basis that you have for having a, an industry worker teach then goes away. Those visas will require a certain level of English language. Um, you know, what happens if you're bringing them in to, to, to teach a foreign language? Um, you know, so, and, we, and we need to do that. We don't have the level of foreign language instructors here that we need. So we're, we're not thinking past the kind of immediate high-level concern, much as they're trying. And then even when we do get somewhere with that, we're saying, well, we don't know what we can do about this. So Erasmus is a great example. Uh, you know, are we going to be part of the Erasmus programme? We don't know. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility that we could be, but that requires the EU to say yes to, to, to our... Erasmus to say yes to our joining post, post the exit. Um, what will that mean if we're in or we're out? We can't plan. We can't change courses so that they no longer have those employment elements. We can't um, make a new, a new um, study abroad option because we don't know what's going to happen. Things are moving far too quickly and, and the change that would require is not going to be able to be completed in the last minute, which will mean a sudden stop for EU students being able to access certain courses until we can change them enough 
and then it will mean UK students not getting the same course that they thought they were going to get because we had to make it more accessible to EU students. It will mean us having to have a break where we can have no exchange if we can't get into Erasmus. So there's a lot, there's a lot of planning that we cannot do. You know, we, we heard in the earlier panel, the fear is the planning that hasn't been happening within the in industry. We, we, can't, we can't plan, we don't know what's going to happen. The civil servants are saying, well, it could be this, it could be this, we could do this. Um, and then, you know, the next day you open the news and, and, and someone, someone has changed their mind. So we can't plan. We are literally planning for multiple scenarios mm -hmm. and not able to enact anything because of the lack of certainty. And, and if decisions are taken, where would they be taken? Which, because I'm thinking cross departments, but it's not. It's only in one department, but, no, it's, but it's affecting other departments. It's, 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 it's DFE for Erasmus. But also in the National Health Service is... is uh, you know, major yeah. employer as well and a contributor. Mm -hmm. So universities actually run across a number of departments, but mm -hmm. our home um, is but in, in terms in of DFE. But, 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 but in terms of DFE, office. but some of the people you need to influence are in the Home the Office. Home office. Yes, the absolutely. DFE can say, well, we can do this, and but if the Home Office doesn't agree... They're going to say agree, boo to a girl, are they? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. OK. And there isn't a cross-government um, strategy group that is looking specifically to EU exit. They've just started an international education strategy, which is the very first time since, oh goodness, probably at least 2007 when they came up with the tiered system, that the different departments of government have got together. But they are focused, as I said, on markets that are not the EU. They are focused on non-EU students. So there isn't that similar thing looking at students in education, bringing together the Home Office, the Health Service, the um, uh, DFE and Bs, it's just, it just isn't existing. Okay. Um, and you've been to see the Mayor, I think, and some delegations, and how did that meeting go? What, did, what, work, what, what came out of that meeting and what happened? I, I, my, my experience is that typically the Mayor is supportive and understands the, the issues. There's been some correspondence between university bodies and, and the Mayor and uh, uh, is trying to put these messages to central uh, government and to support universities as, uh, as, as best is able, I think, to be fair to uh, the, his, his positioning on these things. I think we, we need to, as an assembly, we haven't taken a position. We talked about, did we, we, did we not that even done a motion uh, mm -hmm. on it, have we, in oh. terms of higher education? Higher education, no, we haven't. Well, we haven't. Um, Maybe we should think about that. Okay, we should, we should think about this. So uh, there's a report that may uh, only resolve one aspect that's out, that may come out of civil servants, but will still need to go through the government sausage machine before some hard outcomes will happen. Are there other reports that we should be looking out for? Uh, we could certainly give you uh, plenty of bedtime reading on this particular well, I, I subject. Mean, I, There's policy I, papers and uh, state-of-the-art reviews of where, where I think we are. It would be useful for us to understand about who, who you've been talking to and where we think. Because it, it, it's, it's hard in the hierarchy of <laughs> this complex uh, game. Of, it makes the Game of Thrones look simple in terms of um, some of the relationships. Um, of where, who's going to take what decision and when in this, and who, what, when does it get on someone's table to say, right, this is where it's going? It almost cries out that they need to buy more time, because time is not on your side, is it? A year's funding does not enable you in your models, your, your business models even, to even think about how do you plan for various bits and pieces. And of course, some things won't happen immediately but some will happen immediately and and someone getting an handle on it and understanding what it means in terms of that and to your colleagues outside london they must be having the same conversations as such much that london has done well um there's you're obviously share that sharing the information backwards and forwards about your lobbying. Is that, yes. is that the case? Yeah, and there are national uh, yeah. bodies which yeah. represent the universities to, to government, which yeah. Universities UK is the principal one, and there are a number of mission groups which bring together uh, similar types of universities who also uh, represent their views into a government at all, all levels. And then we're, we're, we're a UK-wide oh, academy yeah. working with other UK academies like the Royal Society 
and also working because there's devolution in this sector mm. yep. with colleagues in the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Learned Society of Wales, and the Royal, the Royal Irish Academy, which covers the whole of the island of Ireland I'm, without a border. Oh. Don't say that. Someone will start to raise other questions. <laughs> really. It's like the rugby team. <laughs> um, well, look, thank you for the way you've raised mm. questions. You've given us some... We need to reflect mm. further, and we probably will want to read the transcript uh, of this exchange, and Just then we may them. come back yeah. to you and ask for maybe some clarity or ask for that information. Certainly, I think we need to think about it. We, one of the first courses of action, can we get the mayoral correspondence uh, and exchanges and, and say to the mayor, we're mindful to to lend some support in some way, but we don't want to cut across whatever he's doing. And again... Yeah, the could I just add one point? In. Having listened to the earlier session with the, on the structural fund, the UK higher education sector has done hugely well in European competitive bidding. But the business sector has been much weaker in its presence in the research system than in many other European countries. Mm. And you might want to think about how you link together whatever your thoughts might be on the future mm. of the research funding system with what you think about measures to help yeah. business community and so on, and maybe developing some different relationships between the business community and the education research community and looking for opportunities of partnership for innovation which is after all quite important mm. very good point yeah. very good point yeah, well thank you very much uh, but, uh, you know um, our sympathies are with you uh, but you know um, but let's see what we can do um, you know um, lend our small voice to it but thank you for the way you've answered our questions but definitely we're going to come back and and, company. and we may well um, invite you back to explore further about some of the issues around um, some of your, your sector, your, the sector employee issues and that relationship, how that works, uh, because we are going to do something again. We've done one session on EU citizens and it keeps moving and someone's got to get a grip. Uh, the idea about the visa issues is quite interesting yeah. around that. But we will see. Uh, but thank you very much. Thank you. Right, if I can go back, we need to go back to the main agenda. Thank you very much. Um, following discussion, can we note the reports and discussions and delegate authority to me as chair in consultation with party group leads and members to agree an output from this Agreed. discussion? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, item 9, date of the next meeting is scheduled for the 30th of October 2019 at 2 p.m. in this chamber. But we are going to explore whether we can bring this this forward uh, for a date mm -hmm. to be determined and to be consulted on amongst uh, mm -hmm. various members of this uh, committee. Uh, item 10, there being no other urgent business, I declare this meeting closed. Thank you. Thank you.